camera along. Um, so there are, there are some some nice examples of uh, of concentration changes. So one of them is um, if I have uh, copper sulfate that's blue. If I add to that some conch hydrochloric acid, it has to be concentrated. Um, we get copper chloride, copper chloride iron. A bit funky. Uh, no, that's not right. What am I doing? Four H pluses and some sulfate. That'll do. That is yellow. So if I add some HCl to my blue copper sulfate, it goes green. Why does it go green? Yeah, you get a mixture of blue and yellow. If I add a bit more HCl, it'll go yellow. If I add a bit of um, Add a bit of water, it actually drives it back that way as well. Um, so, why does the... Let's use the right arrow, shall we? Might not use this video. Um, why, why does it... Why does adding HCl make more make it go yellow or, or green initially? Go on, Mark. Because you're increasing the concentration of the reactants. So, the position of the... Exactly right. So Le Chatelier says we try and minimise the change. If I make a change, let's try and undo it. If I add more HCl to the equilibrium, the equilibrium tries to undo that. In other words, it'll have to reduce the added HCl. So to reduce the added HCl, the equilibrium shifts to the right, makes more yellow stuff and less blue stuff. So the reaction goes yellower, um, and that will reduce the total amount of HCl. So that's going to be the case for all concentration. We're going to, um, if, if we add more reactants, it'll make more products. But it cuts another way as well. But let's just, let's just dwell on this first. So if we increase the concentration of HCl, that will have an effect of shift the equilibrium position to the right to use up the added HCl. So remember, that's our Le Chatelier statement. We always have to say how, how the shift relates to Le Chatelier. So in this case, the shift relates to Le Chatelier by using up the HCl. That's our minimise the change line. We don't say minimise the change, we say what the change is and how it's minimised. Okay. That works really well with the harbour process as well. Now I realise the harbour process, strictly speaking, isn't in solution, so we can't really talk about concentrations of gases. But you, you, you can talk about concentrations of gases because concentration is measured in moles per dm cubed and you could have a dm cubed container of gas and you could say how many moles of ammonia were in that container. So you can sort of talk about concentration of gases. It, it kind of works. Um, it, it's more complicated to talk about the, the pressure of the gases and we'll get onto that next year. Uh, I don't want to do that now. Um, so let's assume we can have concentration of gases just for the, for, for the sake. So obviously if I throw in as much nitrogen and hydrogen as possible, that will increase the amount of ammonia. But there's, only, there's a limit to the amount of nitrogen and hydrogen I can pump into my, my, my ammonia producing uh, container. So what's the other thing that we can do which will pull the equilibrium over 
for the ride. Take ammonia out. We can take the ammonia away. Okay, so if we remove ammonia, then having removed it, the equilibrium will have to minimize that change. So it shifts to the right to make more ammonia to replace the ammonia that's been taken. So we can work it in that way as well. We can add reactants, which will push the equilibrium to the right. But there's only there's a limit to the amount we can do that. Or we can remove products, in which case the equilibrium will try and generate some more for us to make up for the fact that the products have gone. Okay. Uh, so, if we look at how the harbour process works, I'll just bring that up. Don't know how well this is going to show up on camera, but I'll probably um, I'll probably put this PowerPoint on with the. Um, uh, on with the work when I put it up so you can always you know if the, if the PowerPoint's not showing up very well on the on the video uh, you, you should be able to, to have this okay so when we look at how the harbour process is done we take the nitrogen and hydrogen nitrogen of course just comes from the air it's easy 78% of the atmosphere is nitrogen there's plenty of that around hydrogen at the moment mostly comes from natural gas it gets converted into hydrogen those go into uh, uh, a container which um, scrubs the carbon dioxide out of the, uh, of the nitrogen. It's very important you get rid of the carbon dioxide. Um, then it goes into a compressor because we want the pressure to be a couple of hundred atmospheres, a couple of hundred times at atmospheric pressure. And then that goes into a, our converter over here, which has got layers of iron catalysts. Of course, iron's a solid, so we have these beds of iron filings and then the gases pass over those beds um, that will be that will be our 200 atmospheres pressure and of course the whole thing's heated to 450 degrees so we have all those conditions there then we take a mixture of all three gases out of that container and we cool it down and compress it a bit more as well and what happens there is ammonia turns into a liquid you might just want to think about why that is why why of these three compounds would ammonia turn into a liquid first if i start to cool all three of them down we have the two lowest boiling point well it has the um, highest sorry. boiling point actually yeah but uh so so why well it has the highest boiling point and then you come down to that yeah, no, I would condense it because it's got the highest boiling point. The question is why, how would I know, looking at that as a chemist, that ammonia has the highest boiling point? Uh, sorry, fair enough. It's a molecule, so there'll be stronger and more van der Waals forces. There will be stronger van der Waals forces, that's true, but there's something more significant as well Permanent in the intermolecular forces, forces department. Is there any permanent dipole dipole forces? More than dipole dipole. It's got those as well, actually. Hydrogen bonds. Yeah. yeah, remember hydrogen bonds can form any way you've got an OH, NH, or FH bond. They will all form hydrogen bonds. You just need that bond in the molecule somewhere. So ammonia can form hydrogen bonds, which is the strongest type of intermolecular force. Nitrogen and hydrogen, they're both very small molecules, but more significantly, they've only got van der Waals forces. So they have very low... The boiling point of hydrogen is something very, very low. It's minus 200 or something. It's, it's, it's right down there. Whereas ammonia will, will liquefy at a more reasonable temperature. So that's great. So the liquid ammonia literally will pour off. Um, we could just use gravity to separate that. That can go into tanks. And then the nitrogen and hydrogen, of course... We're not going to waste it it gets recycled and pumped back into the system because again if we force more nitrogen and hydrogen in that's going to drive the equilibrium forwards as well okay so we can see how how the harbour process is a really good example of all of these principles of of Le Chatelier's working together the high temperature the high pressure and the um uh, and the, the the concentration or the change in uh, change in the ratio there Okay. Just going to 
Stop it, anything.